Okay, so uh, yeah, today's uh, webinar it's um, it's about the use of two-dimensional models to um, address very large-scale flooding simulation, and and that's um, we're going to uh, be uh, presenting um, the uh, some case studies. Uh, but first, we want to try to answer uh, why do you need or why you want to um, uh, apply uh, two-dimensional models for large-scale simulations. Uh, we want to also discuss a bit why uh, some uh, two-dimensional simulations may encounter challenges. Uh, when dealing with large-scale problems and, and at the end I'm going to present uh, two uh, very large-scale studies that uh, have been conducted recently with uh, the uh, river flow 2D uh, model. So um, why, why do you really need to, to do large-scale simulations in two dimensions? Well, uh, first, there is an increased um, availability of um, large elevation data sets. And this is uh, not only through the DEM, there is a, it's a global DEM database that is, is not so um, high resolution. It's about 30 meter uh, resolution. But there are other databases that are becoming available with the much uh, high resolution data sets and, and this includes uh, not only uh, information coming from hot satellites and remote sensing uh, but also from high resolution lidar and and this high resolution lidar uh, allows you to resolve the terrain in such a detail that may make big difference in in how uh, the, the flooding is being simulated in different domains. Um, so for, for this large scale problems, uh, you need to provide adequate resolution. And, and this high resolution is required not only for the um, different bathymetry that you may encounter, but also internal boundaries you may have bridges, you may have piers, you may have buildings, uh, there, there are roads, there are all kinds of uh, obstacles and, and, and features in, in real world simulations that you want to uh, deal with them in, in high resolution to, to get more realistic results on them. Um, also, you have long rivers. You want to deal with long river reaches and wide floodplains. Uh, this is an increased uh, need to integrate not a single uh, a model just in a, in a very short reach, but try to integrate the models not only from the point of view of hydraulics, but also the hydrology. So you may want to include also uh, a watershed and uh, integrate the watershed hydrology with the routing in the river itself. And that requires a lot of, of, of uh, cells. And, and typically, this large simulation applications uh, require not hundreds of thousands, but uh, in the order of millions, and many millions sometimes, of computational cells. And of course, the more cells you have, and the smaller the cells are, the longer the run times. And that's, that's a big limitation that you may encounter uh, in, in two-dimensional models. Now, the, the data that we are uh, more commonly use is uh, high-resolution LiDAR. And um, we have examples of, of millions and, and sometimes billions of uh, LiDAR elevation points that are becoming available. So your model should be able to deal with this type of, uh, of um, amount of information. Um, the terrain roughness is also um, sometimes available through uh, aerial images and remote sensing. 
Um, rainfall is, uh, is becoming also uh, more commonly available through radar precipitation estimates. Uh, they're, they're just uh, last week uh, has um, uh, a new global database of rainfall has appeared that covers uh, years from, uh, I think, 1979 to 2015 at a global scale. It's not such a high resolution, but it's, it's a global scale. There are some attempts to do uh, regional or continental hydrologic models using these databases. And the inundation extent also through uh, the, the availability of aerials and remote sensing, it can uh, become available. So you have uh, the extent of uh, maybe the maximum extent of a particular flooding event that you can use for calibration. So all this data can be integrated in a, in a large uh, scale model. Now, uh, to be able to, um, to handle this kind of, of uh, huge databases, uh, you, you need some specific requirements imposed on, on two-dimensional models. So the models needs to be capable of resolving the complex terrain and urban areas, and that imposes some, some limitations or requirements for the mesh that you may use. Um, the model, since they, they deal with large areas, you can sometimes no longer separate so clearly the hydrology and the hydraulics. So uh, until recently, what you would do to do a, a flood routing, you will apply separately a hydrologic model that would give you the flow hydrographs. And then uh, you would use that flow hydrograph to uh, apply maybe in a two-dimensional, one-dimensional model uh, to resolve uh, a, a shore reach of the river downstream. Now, with these large models, you may no longer be able to differentiate those, and you would need to include the hydrology and the hydraulics. And that requires especially and temporal variable rainfall, evaporation, and infiltration. So you need to have that in the model. Of course, the two-dimensional flood routing. And if you are uh, analyzing erosion and deposition, you will also need to deal with sediment transport. Now, all this leads to um, requirements on, on memory, because you have to store uh, sometimes millions and millions of, of variables and, and data uh, in the model. And that requires, of course, 64-bit, uh, not only for the, the computational model itself, but also for the graphical user interface that you would need to use to uh, prepare the data for the model and also to visualize the results. So uh, that, that's, that's memory-based. But also, you need to make sure that your model is fast enough. Uh, maybe your model has the, enough memory to handle uh, millions and millions of cells, but if it takes uh, a month to compute a particular event, that is, is not practical. Uh, so you need to be able to make some computations or some computations of the events you want to uh, deal with, uh, the hydrologic and the hydraulic events, in, in practical runtimes. Uh, that means that you should be able to get some results in, in maybe a matter of, of a few hours uh, and minutes, it, it's, it's po if possible. But if you, it would take a, a week to run a model, that, that's certainly possible, but it will make very difficult to, to make it as a practical uh, workflow in your modeling uh, application. So the two-dimensional uh, model options that you have available nowadays are there are mainly two types of model based on the mesh or grid they use. Uh, the first model that were created were uh, square cell models. Um, at some point, you couldn't do better than square cells because the finite difference method that uh, was the, the first that developed for solving the equations that govern the flow in rivers and, and floodplains and coastal areas uh, only could deal with this type of, uh, of 
uh, square cells. Um, the advantages of these models um, are that they're very simple to program. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple to implement a model like this and this type of cells. Uh, it's simple to set up, so the, all the cells are the same size, so that, that's relatively simple to understand, and the data uh, lends itself simply to um, be interpolated to these kind of, uh, of grids. Now, the disadvantages of this um, type of models is mainly that being the cell uh, unique in size, so all the cells are identical, uh, if you need to resolve some features in your model that are very small, maybe you have a riverbed or you have uh, buildings or streets in your model, you need to come up with uh, cells that are very small so that you can capture that particular feature in your terrain. Um, however, uh, the, there are some areas always in models where you don't need such small elements, but since the uh, cells is the same for throughout the, the grid, you're forced to use these small elements. So this leads to a very large number of cells based on, on that resolution that you would impose. And also, uh, these this, uh, square cells being equal uh, they are not very good at resolving irregular geometry. So if you have, for example, a levy, like, like the one that is uh, schematically drawn in the figure here, uh, the, the, the best option would be to refine the mesh if you wanted to, to do it that way. Otherwise, the only way to do it is by the, the staircase approximation of this uh, uh, levy polyline. Also, um, when dealing with very complex terrain, uh, these uh, square cell uh, um, models are not very good at resolving that type of terrain uh, gradients. Uh, so, if, for example, if you have uh, a river bed, uh, the, the banks of the river where you have a very steep gradient, the, the best you could do is to uh, either use a very, very small size uh, of the cells or just uh, assume that uh, the approximation is, is crude uh, and, and that's, that's the best you could do. Now, the, the other type of models is, uh, are what they call the flexible mesh models. Flexible mesh because the mesh is formed mostly by uh, triangles. There are some other models that deal with, uh, with other polygons, but they are, they are polygons or, or triangles that can have any size. So they're flexible because you can have very small elements on one area and large elements in other areas. Uh, the, the main advantage of this um, type of models is that you can adapt your mesh to the actual geometry that you have, the real geometry. So you have obstacles. You have a river, like you see it here. You can refine on the river to capture the topography gradients there if you have buildings. Uh, so you have a lot of control uh, over the, the mesh and how the mesh is capturing the result, the, the, the uh, terrain that, that you have. Um, you can optimize the mesh size by uh, using large elements in the areas where you don't need that much detail or where you have very flat areas, for example. Uh, and that leads to less cells for a given problem. So you don't need that many cells as, as those uh, uh, needed in a, in a uh, grid model. Now, the disadvantages of these uh, models is that they require more programming. It's, it's more difficult to program a, an unstructured uh, mesh model. Um, that's usually not a problem for users, but for, for developers is. Uh, they require mesh generation software, so you, you, you could you cannot do a, a large a mesh uh, manually. If, theoretically, you could do it, but it, it would be impractical to do it. So you need a, a good mesh generation software. Uh, now, the, the dif basic difference, as I explained, if you had a, a, a geometry that is general like this one, a boundary uh, with a, a square grid, uh, the best you could do is just uh, use, uh, you know, just accept some, some kind of approximation. 
Well, in the flexible mesh, you can have as much detail as you want in different areas. So uh, this is uh, probably the, the modern way because uh, to, to go because the, the triangular cell mesh and the flexible mesh in general uh, can do everything that the square uh, cell can do because you can also do a more or less uniform mesh uh, for an area, but it offers you the way to adapt to the, your more realistic uh, area. This is a, another example of a, of a gated structure. Here you see the, uh, the triangular mesh, and, and this is a square mesh as an example. So you see a very crude approximation of this geometry here, which can have effects also on the results sometimes. But also on the performance, you here have uh, in this particular mesh, uh, 400,000 triangles and these 2.2 million squares. So it's a big difference of uh, what uh, you would have in real applications. Um, now, uh, the, the flexible mesh also allows to have, um, uh, you know, in, the, in each triangle, uh, the velocity components and the depth that these are the uh, variables that you normally compute in the 2D model, and they can have any, any flow direction. So it doesn't restrict the velocity direction to a predefined um, fixed directions that also can have some impact on the model results. Now, how can you make this model go faster? Um, normally, two-dimensional models are, are slow because they require a large number of computations. So if you have a flexible mesh model uh, and you have these elements here, one, two, three, four, uh, and, and just as an example, um, you, you need to have a way to make the computations on each cell and then on the whole mesh uh, in a fast way. Now, most codes that have been developed, not only for, for the, um, the greeted models, but also for the uh, flexible mesh models, uh, had been designed originally to be executed one step at a time in, in processors that only uh, deal with one instruction uh, at a time. And uh, in this way, uh, the code, if you need to compute the variables at each element, you would take, uh, you would make the computations element one, maybe then at element three, when you're finished at element four and two and so forth until you finish to cover uh, whatever millions of elements you have. And then you assemble uh, the, the computations for the whole mesh. Now, this is the, the normal approach in one processor CPUs or in older uh, sequential code models. Uh, you do the computation one step at a time. And the only way to accelerate this all codes is by using faster processors. There, there is no other way to use, unless you modify, obviously, the code. Now, uh, many existing models uh, are very difficult to parallelize uh, because they were conceived initially for this uh, single processor computers. And, and the code that you would see there is, is very convoluted. It's, it, it's completely uh, impossible to try to parallelize a code uh, like that, and that would require uh, just rewriting the, the, the whole model. Now, accelerating or using a faster processor was fine until recently, but uh, until uh, 2005 or so, it seems to have reached the, the processor speed has reached a, a, a ceiling and it doesn't seem to be getting any uh, faster uh, anymore. So uh, uh, you re may remember the times when every year you get uh, you could get a new computer that was maybe double as fast as the previous year computer, and that would increase automatically. The same code would be uh, much better performing. Uh, now you get a new computer, and, and you get more or less the same speed uh, for the processor. Now, the only way to uh, make models run faster is to use code parallelization and take advantage of multiple processors 
or multiple core computers. Now, uh, most processors today is um, um, is a uh, is access uh, can access um, multiple core uh, processors, and you have two core, you have quad core, you have eight cores, you have sixteen core, you have a number of options uh, that uh, you have available. However, you have to bear in mind that if your model is not programmed to run in parallel, it doesn't matter what processor you use, uh, and it will not run faster. So your model needs to be parallelized and take advantage of this particular architecture. Now, the, the parallel approach uh, that uh, is the, the way to go in, in to accelerate models is to, uh, for a single time, make the computation simultaneously. So you would send parts of the mesh or a certain region of the mesh or a certain element on the mesh to a, a different uh, processor. So uh, since you have many cores or many processors available, you, you can distribute your, your load, your computations, in a way that at the same time you have a number of uh, elements deal simultaneously. And that speed up can be significant in if it's, if it's correctly done. Then at the end of that time, then you will assemble. But then you, you have uh, um, all these simultaneous uh, um, calculations accelerating your code. Now, with multiple processors, uh, you can go the CPU way or the GPU way. I will talk about what is this. CPU is normally. Uh, what you have in the standard computer is, is the central processing unit that it may have two cores or eight cores. GPU is the graphic processing unit that uh, I, will, I will talk in a minute. So the code parallelization uh, can be done in the CPUs using the standard processors. Uh, there are different paradigms or methods to parallelize the models like this. Or you can use the GPU parallelization. Uh, and, and you have also different languages that can deal with that. All of these options require reprogramming the model. There are no magic way to just add a very fancy hardware and accelerate a model just by itself. Now, in the, in the basic computer or in the standard computers, uh, they are normally limited to 2, 4, 16 or so cores so that uh, the normal parallelization that you would do for these CPUs is not enough. Uh, sometimes it does not scale well. That means if you, uh, if you have maybe more cores, uh, four cores, maybe it's not that you don't get the double of, of the um, uh, performance as you would get with two and so forth. Um, so uh, the, the way that is more accessible for most people nowadays and it's very, very efficient, is to use the graphic processing units, the GPUs. And this is critical for large-scale applications. Now, the graphic processing units uh, are nothing else than cars that were originally designed for, for video processing. And, and there are some cars made today just for computation, but, but many of them can do both things at the same time. And, and they have very interesting characteristics. First, they can have several uh, thousands of processors instead of just a, a few uh, tens of them, uh, as in the CPUs. And they're relatively inexpensive, uh, you know, considering the, the power uh, and the impact that they can have in run times. You can have cards uh, for $500, relatively uh, easy to find. Uh, this is a new card that just came out in market last week. Uh, it, it has a, a very decent uh, memory capacity and, and uh, 2.5 thousand uh, uh, cores and, and so forth. So you have uh, other cards that are also very uh, efficient, the Tesla cards, for example. And I, I, I show here the NVIDIA because the NVIDIA is the uh, offers the technology that we have implemented in the river flow to d model now the way these models uh, work 
uh, just so you understand the, the, the implications that they have in programming, uh, you start with the CPU uh, um, process, uh, then you store your data in the CPU memory, then you have to bring that uh, all that data to the GPU itself, uh, make the computations on the GPU, and when the computation is done, you have to bring back your results to the CPU uh, memory and back to the CPU for uh, output or writing files and things like that. So it's a, it's a complicated process, but the great advantage is that you make use of this massive amount of, of cores or processors that accelerate so much your computations. Now, all of this has been implemented in the Riverflow 2D model. I will show you some case studies today. Uh, Riverflow 2D is a combined hydrologic hydraulic model. Uh, the hydro hydrology component deals with rainfall evaporation and infiltration, and the hydraulic model is a full 2D model in flexible mesh. Uh, it deals with dry and, and wet areas, uh, uses a finite volume, a highly accurate uh, numerical engine, uh, deals with supercritical, subcritical uh, regimes. It has uh, several modules, modern debris flows, sediment transport, uh, pollutant transport. Um, you can have hydraulic structures in the two-dimensional mesh, including bridges, gates, uh, levees, uh, weirs, uh, culverts, and so forth. Um, and it, it's paralyzed uh, for multiple core GPU, uh, CPUs, and also uh, it has a version for high-performance GPU. Now, the high-performance GPU is, is uh, you know, two order of magnitude faster than the, the CPU version. I will show you some results about it. And it's fully integrated with the SMS GUI. Uh, so the graphical user interface that is the basic uh, interface for Rearflow 2D is the SMS. SMS is uh, developed by Aquaveo, and there are many other models that use this uh, user interface. Um, we have recently also developed, in collaboration with Autodesk, uh, a flooding plugin for InfraWorks, which is a software developed by Autodesk. And that software should be uh, commercially available uh, in, from mid-summer this year. Um, now, all of this numerical developments uh, are, are possible uh, by um, due to a collaboration agreement we have with the University of Zaragoza. Uh, this is a very active ag agreement uh, uh, by which we, we uh, get uh, all uh, the, the development expertise of this uh, group. And also, uh, our company uh, funds some uh, developments also, uh, for example, through the uh, funding of uh, research done at the university uh, uh, students that are uh, funded through um, multiple uh, ways. Uh, also through our uh, company that we have in Spain that is uh, in, in uh, high relationship with the university. Now, just so you have an idea of, of the performance gain of, of the GPU, Riverflow to the GPU model, uh, this is a, I don't want to go into the, all the details, but this is a, um, a, a specific run that was made uh, for testing the acceleration that you would get with different uh, graphic cards or, or GPU cards. Um, and, and you see here different meshes. So you have a mesh size, uh, number of elements of the order of 20,000 down to 1.8 million. Uh, this Intel CPU is the time that you would expect in the, uh, in the getting the model without parallelization. And you see here that the times are very, this is eight days, for example, for a 1.8 uh, million cells. Uh, but this is the acceleration that you get here, 147 times for the Tesla K80. This is an NVIDIA card. So instead of eight days, you get uh, results in 1.5 hours, approximately. But there are other cards that are very decent. They're much less expensive, for example, here. Uh, and, and you get results in two hours for this particular mesh. Uh, so you, you see here that the acceleration uh, 
uh, it's, it's much higher for the, the more elements you have. So for large scale problems, that's, that's critical because you, you will not wait eight days for one, only one scenario on a specific runs. But if you have to wait only one hour, you can make, I don't know, 30 or more scenarios in the same time. So it's a big difference. Now, people ask us all the time how your model um, compares with other models. And, and this is an example we ran uh, last year with, with different models, including HECRAS 2D. Uh, beta, was, these are results for the beta version. We don't have yet results for the um, final version, and SRH 2D. Um, and, and these results may vary from, obviously will vary from case to case, but this is just a UK test number five, which is a dam break analysis. And, and you see here, the results for, for different versions of the rear flow 2D models and different hardware, and, and the results of the HECRAS in the same computer, obviously, uh, and, and also SRH 2D. So it's a big difference in, in computer time, so you can see here. Uh, other models, uh, this is flow 2D, for example, it's, it's much slower. And, and I have to say here that we used the basic model, we didn't have access to the pro model. Uh, so times may vary here, but you get a, the idea of, of how big of a difference uh, can make of using a GPU or, or a high-performance uh, CPU model uh, as a real flow 2D. Other commercial models, like uh, this is a comparison with Mic21. Uh, in a dab and break study, 200,000 cells, six-hour simulation dab and break. Uh, in this case, the, the Mic21 takes 40 minutes to run the six hours. And the CPU version of the rear flow 2D model with four cores, uh, it takes five minutes or six minutes almost. And the C uh, GPU 1.7 uh, minutes. So it's a, again, it's a big difference in computer times. Now let me um, go to the the, the case studies I want to share with you today. These case studies uh, have been performed by two different groups. Uh, the first one is, uh, has been developed by NOAA, and particularly with, by the uh, North Central uh, River Forecast Center that is in Minneapolis or, or Minnesota, near Minneapolis. Um, now, the, uh, the, there is a collaboration agreement going on between Hydronia and NOAA, we have provided support uh, to them to do this model. They have provided all the data uh, and, and the expertise on, on this site that I will um, explain in a minute. But the, the main objective of, of this project was to create a large-scale two-dimensional flooding simulation using advanced GPU technology with the rear flow 2D model. This is the main objective. Now, why large scale? Well, because they, they want to have a single integrated model along 420 miles of the Red River of the North. This is the, the river that covers or uh, go through the city of Fargo. Uh, so this is the area, uh, just so you have an idea of how big this uh, river is. It, it comes from south of uh, Minnesota, it, it crosses uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, and, and gets into uh, Manitoba in, in uh, Canada. So it's, it's more than 600 kilometers of rivers uh, uh, with with number of tributaries and all kinds of uh, you know hydraulic structures and and uh, urban areas and uh, different uh, streets, uh, roads, etc. Uh, just so you have an idea of, of the site, this is the, it's, it's a very, very, very flat area. And you see here that the uh, flooding is, um, is uh, governed in some cases by these uh, levees that are formed by the roads that, that cover most of the uh, 420 uh, river reach uh, floodplain. Now, there are many hydraulic modeling challenges for NOAA. Uh, first, the, the 1D model they have uh, there is not accurate enough, and you can imagine, if you go back to this figure here, uh, modeling this with a, two, with a 1D model is not the best of the ideas. 
so they have they have a big accuracy issue with the 1D model they are using now. Uh, it's a complex overland flow with multiple branches sometimes. Uh, the even the the uh, 1D model uh, uh, requires three to nine hours to run uh, for for the kind of hydrograph they have. The kind of hydrograph we we're talking about 90 day hydrograph uh, often. So it's a big issue for them because they require they, ideally they would require results in less than two hours because the this center is providing. Uh, forecast fl uh, flooding forecasts for different cities, so they they cannot wait for a week or or, or even a day to get results of the model they are doing. So for for this testing, what we uh, develop uh, is an integrated um, uh, elevation data set. It was originally uh, formed by more than I think nine million points, but it was sampled for lower resolution. But it was quite quite good. Uh, it was originally a lighter for the floodplain, uh, an in-channel survey that was uh, merged to get a single uh, elevation data set. Now the, there were a number, uh, I think about forty-five different inflow locations um, corresponding to tributaries that are getting into uh, the area. This is the extent of of the. Um, modeling area. Uh, again, it covers about 420 miles. Uh, this is the merge elevation data set. And uh, just to show a, a single area here represented in this rectangle, uh, we, we have been experimenting with different uh, meshes. And, and you see here one uniform mesh that has about one, one million cells. Uh, this is a refined mesh where we only refine the, the floodplain in immediate um, relationship with, with the river itself. And this is a high resolution mesh here. So uh, one of the advantages of the flexible mesh is that uh, in areas where uh, you don't get uh, that much frequent flooding, you don't need to have a lot of detail. But you want to have a lot of detail in the areas that are more important for, for your uh, Flooding maps and things like that. Um, this is a, a animation prepared by uh, Sierra La Casta from University of Zaragoza. Uh, it's a 90-day um, simulation that we have performed, and, and this is with a high-resolution mesh, uh, about 4.5 uh, million cells. But um, just to get an idea of the level of detail that you get with this, you see these branches that are being activated and deactivated. You have all the meandering uh, rivers we solve. Uh, it's a threaded uh, river with with the very complex interaction of the river floodplain uh, with the river banks itself. So it's a ninety day. Let me. Uh, show it uh, until the end here. Okay, so uh, how good are the results that we have obtained so far? Well, we have 20 measurements locations that are uh, mostly formed by USGS uh, gauges, but we have also high water marks along the whole reach, and they uh, correspond in this particular example that I'm showing to a flood of 2011, one of the highest and uh, historic floods in the in this river. Um, these are comparison of for the one million cell mesh uh, between um, water elevations measured and uh, calculated. So um, on, on this uh, twenty something points. So you see, for the most part, and this is a, another way to look at the, the results, uh, these are the maximum water surface elevation uh, model and, and measure. Uh, for the most part, they are very close. You can see here the, the actual results. There are many places that are right on target. Some of them high, have a higher differences, mostly on near the entrance of tributaries that may have the influence of some local influence that is not accounted for in the model. But the, um, the results are quite good for this uh, such a large model. 
And also the inundation extent is, is very similar to, to the one that was captured with these aerial images here. Uh, these are two examples of, uh, of uh, the actual uh, flooding with the uh, model results shown in blue, greenish colors here. Now, from the performance point of view, the Red River of the North application, um, the um, 90 day hydrograph and the 1 million cells, it takes about two hours in a GTX Titan Black GPU. Uh, for the 600,000 cells, it takes about 36 minutes. So you have a, 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 an idea, a comparison with, with the model they have, uh, the operational model they have, the 1D model. There, a 30-day hydrograph takes about three hours. So uh, the GPU, river flow to the GPU, uh, it, it's, is performing faster than the 1D model. Now, uh, you would ask why 1D model is, would be faster, would, would be slower here than a 2D model. Well, uh, the, in order to represent this flat area, the 1D model needs to use a lot of storage areas. And these storage areas are in the order of, of 2,000 that are there. And uh, as you may know, the uh, interaction of a, of a 1D uh, with, a, with a 2D storage area uh, is, is done through uh, weirs, and that's uh, an iterative process that takes a long time in, in the headgrass model. So uh, the uh, conclusions of this uh, uh, application is that the, the, the model uh, shows promise to to be applicable as a forecast model in in the Red River of the North, and and now there is an ongoing uh, collaboration that is uh, is to extend the calibration of of the model to to the river. Uh, the second um, case study I want to show you today uh, is the uh, Tasmania statewide flood model. Um, uh, Tasmania, uh, as you will see, uh, and you may know, is, is an island, it's, it's a whole province in, in, in Australia. And uh, the idea is uh, to m evaluate the feasibility of a statewide flood model for the whole island. Um, it is a proof of concept, so uh, they, they wanted to see if if it was possible to have an integrated model or for the whole uh, state. And it was prepared uh, for the Office of Security and Emergency Management, the Department of uh, Premier and Cabinets Tasmania, uh, just recently. And I need to acknowledge, uh, actually, this was developed uh, uh, by Ted Rigby at uh, Rienco Consulting. And, and all of what you see here today uh, was developed by Tech Rigby, and, and he did a, a very, very impressive job in putting together all this proof of concept for the government in Tasmania. Uh, Colin Massingar uh, is, is the head person at the Mineral Resources Tasmania, uh, uh, trying to evaluate if this is feasible or not for, for their uses. Um, Alan Sunderland, Tom Merlin also um, uh, supported the setup of, of the SMS. Uh, in, in the whole island, and, and also Sierra La Casta, uh, he, he helped uh, in, in the model runs that were done in the Tesla K40 uh, at, at the University uh, of Zaragoza. So um, it, it is an impressive work, as you will see in the results I uh, will show in the next slides. So this is Australia, and you have here the island of, or the province of Tasmania. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very big island. It's uh, comparable to Ireland. If you, if you look at it, it has similar uh, areas and size. And it's about uh, 315 kilometers wide and 350 kilometers uh, from south to north. And the topography is, is really uh, complicated. If you, if you go to Google uh, Earth and, and, and see the, the uh, topography it, it is it is a scary for for any hydrologic model um, this is just a um, um, delineation of some of the watersheds actually it's a very crude uh, delineation of watersheds they are about 48 in this delineation 
but there are many many other watersheds that are important and and uh, you know it's considered you have a in the order of 300 and something watersheds uh, that, that should be considered uh, in in a model like this now the the background of the statewide flood model for Tasmania uh, is that the department has been considering developing a, such a centralized model uh, to to get more consistent uh, results for the mapping and the flooding evaluations they are doing. And however, the investigations that were done until recently had suggested that uh, such a model was not practical. Uh, either because the memory requirement or the setup of the model or because also of the computer times that were involved that were really uh, unrealistic. Now, the, the, um, uh, the, the objectives or, or the concerns that they moved to try to develop such a, a, a large model was that the flood studies that were available uh, did not ensure uh, you know, very consistent uh, flood mapping, uh, and and they were done by by different models uh, with different uh, objectives, uh, uh, different resolutions, and and they they were not very encouraging. Uh, also, when when one watershed uh, covered different local government areas, that created another problem because some you know the same uh, watershed was uh, modeled by different by different uh, tools and that created uh, inconsistent results so the the idea is to have uh, a single model that can be updated with new topography as it comes uh, that would integrate the whole the whole uh, uh, province and that would use uh, uh, you know if you had better quality data you could have a, a, a good also uh, uh, version control system applicable for all watersheds and that the results would be consistent and reproducible. Also, the fact that was, this would be a single uh, model, it would promote uh, the, the local expertise of an in-house team of the, the government. Um, now, the objectives of this uh, proof of concept then is to was to try to construct and operate a single statewide flood model uh, with uh, focusing on construction, uh, practicality, usability of results or accuracy, and runtime practicality. You know, so it, it, is this feasible or not? So um, uh, Ted Rigby um, took the job of of um, putting together this this proof of concept. So um, he uh, developed the whole um, interface using SMS and the River Flow 2D uh, generic model for uh, SMS. And he used a number of, of uh, data that was provided by the government, uh, GIS data in forms of shape files, uh, rasters uh, um, for the elevation data sets. Uh, he used a uh, combination of slider and DEM of different resolutions. And then the mesh that was developed included cells that are, were uh, big on the ocean side. Uh, looked at the actual mesh, not only covers the, the island itself, but also these other islands that form part of the Tasmania as well. But they are separated, so they are they're, they're, uh, some uh, uh, water, ocean water in between. The, the actual uh, smaller islands and, and the main island. Um, so in the land, uh, the cells uh, change in resolution from 10 meters to 250 meters uh, in some areas. And, and also in an area of interest that was used in the proof of concept model, uh, they are very small cells to, to see the impact of using very small uh, cells in those areas. So this all uh, adds up to uh, seven, 0.6 uh, million cells for the whole mesh, and this is part of the how the mesh was constructed. There was uh, uh, buffer zones just to uh, ensure that the the main uh, rivers were correctly captured with with the mesh. 
And you see here part of the mesh, this is the high resolution uh, 2 to 5 meter mesh uh, in one area of interest. Uh, but then you have all kinds of features that uh, allow the, the mesh to resolve this, uh, this uh, uh, topographic feature. Uh, so if, if you look at the mesh in 3D, you, you get scared a little bit because of the huge number of uh, elements on one side, but also for the irregularities of, of the terrain. You know, Tasmania is a really irregular uh, uh, geography that, that uh, it, it's very important for, for the hydrology model to capture in detail. Uh, this is another detail, higher uh, resolution. So you see here, uh, these black areas are not uh, really black. They're just black because they, they have so many uh, cells on it that the, the uh, rendering uh, shows them as black. But you see that the, the, the mesh captures uh, very well the terrain. This is a view um, of the actual model. This is a, the real flow 2D model. Uh, and you see here the, uh, all the features that are captured, all the uh, rivers and, and watersheds. Um, this is uh, a part of the results of the model. You see here already, there was a rainfall that was applied, a six hour rainfall that was applied over the whole island, just as a, a proof of concept. River Flow 2D can handle variable uh, in space rainfall and, and obviously in time. So you can have different uh, gauges uh, being used for the whole uh, area or, or just have a, a storm on a particular area uh, of the of the island, but um, in this case, uh, it was a, a uniform um, yetograph that was used for the whole island. Um, this is a very quick uh, animation that shows the, the uh, a nine-hour simulation. So it's very very quick, uh, but let me repeat it here. This is the final. Um, you see the the hundreds and hundreds. Of, of watersheds that are activated by this storm. So uh, it's, it's very quick. Uh, obviously, this is not the model running. It's just the, the model animation. But um, uh, it, it gives you a sense of how complex such a model is. This is uh, in more detail, another area. So you see here that automatically the model, uh, it, you don't need to define this uh, this uh, uh, drainage system, it's just captured by the, the excellent mesh that was created here. Now, uh, to see the accuracy of results, there was, a, there was no calibration here, just the model was run with, with some reasonable uh, values. Uh, but it was compared with a previous study, a previous uh, model that was developed here uh, some time ago. And, and the results were really encouraging. The, the differences between the uh, computed uh, river flow to the value and the previous uh, results were very close, even though there was no calibration here. So that gives you an idea of how accurate the model can be uh, after it's calibrated. Now, from the performance point of view, the um, uh, the uh, model, the CPU model with eight cores, uh, took about 90 hours to model, nine hour event, and the uh, GPU model uh, runs in about 4.5 hours. So uh, instead of three, almost four days, uh, it takes uh, only four hours, so four and a half hours. So the conclusions of this um, uh, case study uh, are mainly that uh, in the past, uh, not practical, it wasn't considered not practical, uh, and, and it's still not practical to use a uniform fixed grid resolution model uh, because of the large number of cells and the computer time that would require. And uh, it, it's feasible to construct a single uh, a statewide flood model uh, for Tasmania using SMS and real flow to the GPU. The preliminary results uh, uh, show similar uh, um, uh, depth with respect to previous studies, and the run times are in hours uh, instead of days or weeks, which makes it uh, uh, realistic to be applied as a statewide uh, model. Now, just to uh, finalize uh, what I had here for today, is uh, just some comments. 
Um, the, the use of GPU models, uh, such as Reaflow 2D, uh, it, they, they open the door for realistic large-scale 2D simulations. Uh, it, this is very recent, actually. Just a, just a few years ago, this was considered totally impossible. Um, uh, there, are, there are other large scale uh, simulations uh, going on elsewhere in the world, and, and people are trying to, to go to bigger and bigger scales and higher and higher resolutions. And this is made possible by this the technology that does not require really big hardware uh, expenses. Um, um, the run times are uh, reduced from days to hours, or hours to minutes. And as the hardware improves, uh, you would expect to get also improved uh, um, performance with, with new hardware that is coming out. So, um, so that's what I had for for today. If you if you have uh, oh yeah, let me um, let me give you one piece of information. I, I have a couple of questions about that, and I had this um, limited time offer that I uh, I was asked to to provide to you today. Um, the uh, just for the pricing, I have a, several questions about it. Uh, the the uh, river flow to the um, th there is an offer for all users of SMS. Uh, so if you have SMS already, uh, there is uh, the, the model cost uh, um, two thousand nine hundred seventy-five US uh, dollars, and that includes in the offer the CPU and GPU versions, and and one module of your choice, the Modflow the pollutant transport or, or sediment transport. So all, all of this for, for this uh, very, very low price. Um, also, if you want the complete system, uh, you get both licenses of uh, GPU and CPU with the SMS and one module uh, for this price here. And the academic discount, you get all modules and also the GPU version. Uh, but on top of the um, discount that you normally get, uh, you get two permanent licenses and unlimited annual student lab licenses. So this is a good deal for for uh, academic institutions. If you have further questions, just feel free to contact our sales uh, depth at sales at hydronia.com. And if you have any questions, uh, I have all the questions here. I will try to uh, answer them. Um, now, so let me uh, quickly go over that uh, here. Okay. Okay. The question. I have a question. Very interesting question here. They ask if if the results of the model are the same regardless if the model is run on the CPU or the GPU, and the answer is is yes. They are ex not not the same. They are exactly the same or almost exactly the same. Every time uh, that we do any development in GPU, we make sure that. Uh, the results are compared with the CPU version, and we have a number of metrics to uh, compare, and and they are exactly the same. So you you should expect the same. Maybe, maybe you have uh, differences in the order of ten to the minus ten or something. So it's they are for all practical purposes they are they are the same. Um, Rainfall hydrograph, I uh, have a question regarding the error between input and output volume is zero. The, the river flow to the volume conservation is almost exact and is in the order of 10 to the minus 14%. And this is due to the finite volume method that, um, uh, that the model uses. So it's there, there should be no difference between input and output volume. 
Um, <laughs> I have a, a technical question here. How did you guys get over the data transfer bottleneck between CPU and GPU? Well, uh, it, it, it is it is a good question, and and effectively there is a bottleneck between CPU and GPU. Uh, so every time you transfer data between the CPU and the GPU, there, there is a, a, an overhead that you need to pay for that. And what we do is, is we, um, we bring all the data to the GPU and the, the model is running all the time on the GPU. And only is transferring data back to the CPU when you need to output results. So every time you want to output results, maybe uh, every hour or every whatever time you, you select as a report interval, the model transfers the data. So it is true that that slows down the model. If you want to run uh, you know, a 90-day hydrograph and you use a, 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 you know, a one-second output interval, that will slow the model quite significantly because it has to go through the, the CPU to output the results. But in those cases, what you do is you use uh, um, an output interval that is more reasonable, maybe one hour or maybe something like that, that will, will diminish the, the performance overhead here. Um, we have a question here. If we did compare 1632 of 64 course results with GPU, uh, we have compares up to, I think, 32. And uh, GPU Tesla still uh, greatly um, outperforms the CPUs. So the, the CPU option is, is always much, much faster. Um, Okay, um, how does the model compare with SWIM or two-flow engine, en engines? Uh, I don't have it here with me, but we, uh, Aquaveo did a, a model performance uh, simulation uh, some times ago. I can provide that to you for a one, one particular case that had, uh, I think, about 400,000 or 600,000 cells. And rear flow to the GPU was about one tenth of the time required to as that of two flow uh, um, finite volume model, the, the flexible mesh model. So uh, if I remember well, two flow required like 20 hours, and rear flow to the GPU required like two hours to to run the same the same mesh. And they were both developed exactly with the same uh, tools of SMS. Um, I have a question here about the limited time pricing. When it ends? Well, I don't know. It's, they they just told me that it's a limited time. Uh, they didn't indicate. I it normally based on the previous uh, offers, it may maybe a couple of months or so. Um, Okay, someone here asked about uh, large data sets with SMS, um, uh, with H5 files. Um, well, in this case, uh, the files are, are quite big. They are several gigabytes. Um, so, yeah, the, the main problem, if you are using SMS for this large projects. First, you need to make sure you use the 64-bit option uh, model. And second, you need to have lots of RAM memory. So uh, we recommend at least 32 gigabytes of RAM memory, uh, only for handling of the graphics and the mesh and things like that. So uh, even though you have the 64-bit, but if you have only maybe 16 uh, gigabytes, that may not be enough for these large uh, uh, models. Um, another question about the sum, if, if losses can be caused by dry cell definition? Again, no. There are no loss or volume conservation error due to dry and wet cells in river flow 2D. And this is one of our 
guarantees. We warranty that the volume conservation error in river flow 2D is always in the order of 10 to the minus 12 or less percent, regardless of the dry and wet areas. And that's something that we can demonstrate and you can uh, also check for yourself in, in the model. Um, uh, oh, I have many other questions. Uh, let me see if I can go to a couple of more. I'm running out of time here. Um, there are no issues with the Windows 10. No, actually, we are running Windows 10 in our, our, our computers now, and, and there are no problems about that. Um, I have a question here. If you can move a model, make a mic, uh, or Hecras or to flow, uh, to river flow to D. Well, uh, any model that you have, uh, any flexible mesh model that you have in SMS, it's very simple to move it to river flow to D. So if you have a uh, two flow, uh, flexible mesh or SRH to D, or FastWEMS or all the other models that are supported in, in uh, uh, SMS, it's, it's very straightforward to uh, run it in River Flow 2D. Uh, with respect to HECRAS, we have a tool that extracts HECRAS uh, cross sections and they can be imported in, in, um, in River Flow 2D, but it's not a a uh, simple way to just make a conversion from HECRAS 2D to River Flow 2D. Um, okay, I let me see one more question. Uh, does the GPU version can be used on a Unix, Unix cluster or supercomputer? Uh, well, we do have for uh, mostly the University of Zaragoza in the developments. Um, they, they use a Linux version, uh, that is the original version that was ported to, or is ported every time to any changes done to Windows environment. But we don't offer a commercial version for, for uh, Linux or Unix. Um, however, if you are interested, we can uh, discuss that. Uh, it can be a customized uh, development that, that we could do. Uh, but that that would be uh, something we we need to discuss, and the you know the effort that would be required for that. Um, uh, a final question. Um, they asked me about the the flexible time step. Uh, yes, the the river flow to D model. Um, it it uses dynamic time step. It's automatic, so the model automatically. Uh, selects the best time step and it's dynamic it varies during the simulation so you may at some point have a larger time step and at some point a very small time step depending on the gradients and a number of of conditions that occur in in the in the modeling during the modeling so but you don't need to as a user to select the time step it's automatically selected by by the model Okay, so I'm run out of time. I, I really um, wanted to thank you for attending to today's webinar. Really appreciate um, your interest. And uh, again, if you have any questions, you feel free to uh, email us at um, support at hydronia.com and we'll be happy to answer uh, or uh, hear your comments as well. Okay. Um, hope to see you in next uh, webinar.